Hello, friends. Here we are again another on another Wednesday afternoon for our God given God's good table rather um, YouTube show. And uh, I'm leading off today with uh, uh, my electrolytes from Relight and Energizing Morning Blend in my water. So let me take a sip. Oh, that was an ugly sound. Anyway, you got to stay hydrated. So there we go. We are ready to roll today. Today I'm interviewing Pork Ryan, otherwise known by some as Ryan Curtin, my friend for a long, long time. There he is with one of his favorite little critters. <laughs> so, <clears throat> excuse me. Ryan, welcome. How are you? Hey, Maureen. How are you holding up? I'm holding up okay. I decided to get out of the house today to get some work done so that I would not be either um, stressed by all the housework that was waiting or um, have a cat plop onto my lap and my keyboard as often happens in my studio upstairs. So I'm at my favorite grocery store where I've been hanging out and working and now it's three o'clock, so I hope everyone can hear me okay. I've got my headset on to hopefully cancel out some of the noise in the background. And Ryan, you're there, I'm presuming at home, but I could be wrong. Um, but let me just say a little bit about Ryan before we get rolling, and I'll have him introduce and tell a little bit about himself as well. But I met Pork Ryan a few years ago at a Homesteaders of America event on the Rory Feek Homestead in Columbia, Tennessee. I'd heard about him, and uh, I think I think we had spoken and been at a couple of events together before, but I, I think I finally introduced myself there. And I was glad I did because you're the real deal. And we've grown to love you so very much and appreciate you so very much. Um, one of the things that we love about you is that you are you are who we see. You're not fake. You don't hide. You're very uh, forthright about life and all that that entails, including struggles, and that's very refreshing. So, um, Pork Ryan, I'm going to let you tell a little bit about yourself, including how you got your name. That might help. <laughs> but go ahead and introduce yourself to our listeners. Well, first of all, thank you for having me here, Maureen. Really appreciate it and uh, glad to be a part of the God's Good Table family. Um, yeah, you I'd are. say... <laughs> you know, Maureen, now, you are. <laughs> Maureen, Maureen uh, well, it basically acts like she's one of my moms. So, uh, you know, it's got a got to... She'll put me in check every now and then, but you know. <laughs> you know. Yep, every now and then. But uh, yeah, a little bit about me uh, to your audience. Uh, some of you might know me. If you don't, uh, my name is Pork Ryan, the Pork Evangelist. Uh, how did I get the name? Uh, I actually used to hate pigs, believe it or not. You say hate pigs? Hated pigs. Uh, I was how farming out. Hate? How could I hate pigs? They're oh, so they're... cute. <laughs> oh, 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 yeah, they're cute. They look and cute. they're fun. Until you raise them and you realize that they're mischievous. They're highly intelligent, which makes them yep. uh, um, very easy and prone to boredom, which makes them very prone to escapism. Yes. Uh, and so uh, I was farming out in Texas and had a lot of times where uh, first time ever raising pigs, I, we were raising cattle, I had that figured out. We had dairy goats, which by the way, don't ever recommend anyone getting into that. Uh, I love them <laughs> too. I love them too. <laughs> but uh, they were also uh, kind of uh, uh, something I had figured out. We had chickens figured out. I had everything on in our livestock enterprise figured out except for the pigs. No one knew how to raise pigs. It was my first time raising pigs, and um, especially out on pasture. So uh, yeah. I struggled. I really struggled to love pigs because they were breaking infrastructure and property. Um, they I just didn't have the kind of control that I'm used to having with other livestock. Uh, so God used pigs to humble my heart. Um, one time we had a sound named Louise and she broke through 
uh, four different forms of infrastructure. Uh, they had to call me back to the farm to, to capture her. And um, she had plenty of pasture in her isolation pen, plenty of space, a shelter, water feed, everything you would need for a pig. Yeah. She still broke out of that. And when she did, uh, I had a come to Jesus moment where I realized that um, maybe this is a me problem. So I got down on one knee, uh, grabbed Louise by her big fat jaws and said, Louise, I want to love you so hard that just maybe I'll understand you because right now I really don't. And so before there's any brand, before being on national television, before speaking at a bunch of events, I think that's when pork rind was born. And ever since then, um, I'm having a passion uh, in terms of developing local food, passion for farming and homesteading, passion for cooking. Um, so I used to be a pit master and uh, just a you know personal home cook. And I'm really passionate about connecting people, not just simply back to their roots, not just their ancestry, but also back to healthier eating, healthier lifestyle, and a healthier mentality. Very good. You've said a lot there. And I could tell stories about pigs too, but I won't because this is for you. <laughs> That'll go in a book sometime. But yes, pigs are very intelligent, very entertaining, very mischievous, very, very definitely. And I'll just say just briefly, we're going to circle back eventually to the clean, unclean, is pork really okay question, but that's not where we're starting out. We'll touch on that later. But just for those of you watching who might be going, what? You call yourself a Christian and you're talking about pork and pigs? Just, just hold off and we'll address that in a little while, but not just yet. Because what we're really here to talk about today is, uh, Ryan, I'm going to Okay, since I'm one of his moms, I get to call him Ryan, but I'll try to say pork Ryan. Okay. I think when I first met you, that was the acceptable way to address you, but you come to my house, you sit at my table, you're, you're going to be Ryan to me. And I think we've, we've come to that agreement, right? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Thanks. Um, but anyway, um, so you started out in Texas on a farm, and now you're in North Carolina, and uh, you have a degree in agriculture, right? Yeah, so originally I am from North Carolina, born and raised, lived most of my life there, uh, born in uh, Union County, Monroe, North Carolina, uh, okay. lived a lot of my life in Charlotte, North Carolina, and uh, moved to Greensboro, North Carolina uh, when I attended uh, North Carolina A&T State University and um, just love the area. Uh, I did drop out of college to go farm. Uh, so my mom really loved hearing that, um, but I farmed both in Texas and then at a farm in North Carolina, managing different regenerative organic livestock operations. And then eventually I went back uh, to changed my degree uh, from animal science to agriculture education uh, because I realized through my farming journey that I really love teaching people to connect back to the land, to connect with livestock, to connect with their food. Um, so yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah, good. And so you've worked up quite a name for yourself in the regenerative pork industry in particular. You're not into locking, locking animals up into cages and um, feeding them an unnatural diet and pumping them with antibiotics and then selling them to the stores and, you know, helping people to be sick, not healthy. Anyway, you've abandoned all of that and you're doing a lot of teaching all over the country. And, and I might add to our viewers, um, you go to Africa every year or every couple of years and help people there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I've been to Uganda three times and to uh, Tanzania uh, twice, and I'm already planning for my next visit back to Uganda for the summer. And I do missions work uh, over there. So I'll teach farmers um, in their context because they do not have the same context that American would. Um, and so I help train them to figure out not just how to raise livestock in their context, but also how to be profitable. So, so yeah. Yeah. Oh, good. And I know that that's a, a lot of help to them. 
Um, you're a good, you're a big help to people everywhere. But I think that's really cool that you do that in Africa to help people there too. And uh, I'm sure you've seen many things and hopefully many good things. How many trips have you made over there? Three trips to Africa uh, and to two different countries there. Okay. All right. Good. And excuse me, guys, I have my phone on do not disturb. And yet somehow my daughter-in-law tried to FaceTime me. So I'm trying to turn it off and, and uh, get out of that to not be distracted. But it was momentarily distracting. Anyway, um, now that we've gotten past that and we have a little bit of history, um, I want to dig into today's topic, which is something that I've been curious about myself. Um, and I'm sure that many of our listeners are as well. So I want to start out first with what is a carnivore diet? And maybe if you can kind of compare that to some other diets, like in particular keto, because people will get those two confused somehow. So let's lead off with that. Yeah. So, uh, you know, the reason why we're talking about that is uh, because I've transitioned to a carnivore diet. Um, so I've, I've done both keto and carnivore. Um, keto was a really eye-opening experience for me. Um, I was 50 pounds overweight um, prior to doing keto first. And um you know, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about just kind of the shame and self-esteem issues that came with that. Um, but uh, yeah, in terms of the difference between carnivore and keto, main thing is you're not allowed to eat plants and carnivore is kind of the point. Um, yeah. You have some who are a little bit more extreme in carnivore and it's including you don't eat dairy either, which would include um like whole milk, Greek yogurt, can't eat that, uh, butter, not allowed, heavy cream, not allowed. Uh, for me, I am predominantly carnivore. The only thing that I eat that's not carnivore is um, a cup or less of berries, which is a kind of a principle in keto. Um, so if anyone, if you don't know what keto is, basically uh, keto comes from um, ketosis. And so it's helping the body use fat as an energy source rather than carbohydrates, whether it's yeah. starches like potatoes or sugars like a Krispy Kreme donut. Um, <laughs> Which we don't so, recommend for anyone on any diet. No, exactly. hundred percent. Now if that's your guilty pleasure. That's on you. Um, mm -hmm. You know, but for someone like me, I realized that I actually couldn't moderate. Um, I just simply needed to abstain from certain foods and um, also to help with, um, uh, inflammation in my body and in my system as well. So that's part of the reason why I cut out a lot of carbs and junk food altogether. Yeah. Um, so yeah, a lot of people think that the carnivore is, you know, this crazy diet that's for a bunch of weirdos or Joe Rogan fans. Um, and for me, I wanted to see a, how my body would feel on carnivore versus keto. Um, yeah. and then also being able to see if there are any vegetables and plants that I was eating that was causing any additional inflammation in my body. That's really interesting. I've thought about doing carnivore for a period of time also to see what would happen. Um, but here's, here's the one thing that I have that I have a question about, because I think this is really important. Um, we recommend eating fermented foods, uh, fermented and not canned, not pasteurized things like sauerkraut fermented pickles or kimchi. And those foods are very, very enzymatically rich and help you to digest fat and protein. So I don't think my body would do well without that, even if it's just drinking the brine, which is what I typically do. I don't enjoy eating sauerkraut as much as I do maybe taking a swig of the, of the brine from that. Is that even considered on a carnivore diet at all? You said you're eating berries, so maybe a quarter cup of brine from sauerkraut juice or something. Um, am I really throwing you for a loop here? No, that's, a, I think, a really good question. And again, like, uh, I'm not strictly carnivore. And the reason why I'm not is because 
Um, you know, I still kind of have a sugar addiction. Uh, you know, carbs made me feel happy. Uh, and so um, I realized for me to have a sustainable experience with carnivore, I needed to at least incorporate some type of sweet fruit um, okay. that still would be within like, you know, ketogenesis. So, mm -hmm. you know, keto carnivores still operate on uh, ketones and things like that. That's um, what I was thinking, that if you're on a carnivore diet, you're probably in ketosis mm -hmm. anyway, right? Mm -hmm. Are you in ketosis all the time? Yeah. So by eating no more than a cup of berries, I can maintain ketosis. If okay. I start eating more than a cup of berries, and I say berries because uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, most other fruits, the sugar content is just too high uh, per yeah. gram in comparison Including to berries. berries. Yeah, yeah, you're mm -hmm. talking low, low carb berries like uh, like old fashioned blueberries or or blackberries, mm -hmm. or what else? Some would say strawberries would count. It just depends on where you get your strawberries. So like if I went out to a, a, a farm during strawberry season, like, and pick my own strawberries, eh, the strawberry's pretty sweet. Um, but the yeah. average store-bought strawberry usually is not gonna be super high in sugar content. Oh, see, because I thought that, uh, I think they're very sweet. Um, and my thought was that because they've been hybridized to the point that they they are hybridized to produce the sweetest strawberry. But at home, spring into summer, I do like to pick the tiny little wild strawberries, which are not so sweet, but they're packed with, with good strawberry flavor. I don't make a habit of that. I just, I do it often. Um, but blueberries blackberries, obviously cranberries, but that's not really a berry like we traditionally think of a berry. Um, those things, they may be fruit, but they're not very sweet. So it makes sense. Yeah. I still think it would be good to at least have some brine from the ferment to help keep your gut in check. So if I were to do keto, I would do that. But that's not yeah. something you ever hear about, is it? Yeah, so on keto, I fermented my own sauerkraut uh, because yeah. I do believe in eating living foods. Um, yeah. You know, we talk about raw milk being a living food mm -hmm. uh, compared to pasteurized milk. Um, you know, again, for me, going on carnivore, it really is to kind of test the limits of my body in a safe way, but also to see um, through elimination if there was any additional inflammation that I had in my body because I was eating certain vegetables. Uh, and that's the thing that uh, that's important about carnivore. We're not doing it just to be weird. Um, mm -hmm. We're doing it because there are people who certain vegetables um, cause inflammation in their yeah. gut system. Uh, it doesn't contribute to bettering their autoimmune disorders and things like that. So for me, I don't suffer from autoimmune disorders, at least not that I know of. Um, and so I can be a little bit more flexible with my diet versus someone like um, Jordan Peterson or whoever, who's just completely eating beef and salt and that's it, um, yeah. you know, and has the best health in their life because of it. You know, I don't necessarily want to go on that journey because I love having a variety in my diet, um, yeah. you know, but in terms of like plant consumption, uh, general biological sciences with that and why a lot of people on carnivore don't eat plants, is because a lot of plants don't actually want to be eaten, or if they do want to be eaten, only certain parts want of that plant wants to be eaten. So fruit, for example, yeah. plants want their fruit to be eaten. They don't want the seeds to be eaten, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and so they'll have different kinds of chemicals or hormones um, that would uh, either be anti-nutrients or yeah. um, would be more so uh, like, People will say, oh, well, did you know that with apple seeds, there technically is arsenic in it? Yeah. Well, for a human, that's not going to kill you if you eat a couple of apple seeds. It, but... It's actually beneficial in minute amounts, like right. the amount you get in an apple seed. Right. But if you're an insect, that's a completely different experience. 
Mm -hmm. um, you know, so there is a is a level of biological science that goes into why people do carnivore uh, and why people stay away from certain foods, particularly plant based yeah. foods. Now, what I would say is if you had to eat plants, I think the best way to eat them would be through fermentation. Mm -hmm. um, and part of the reason with that is like we think about protein. Not all protein is is equal. Not all protein is made the same. Not all protein is going to be uh, bioavailable to the person eating it. So protein from an egg, very easy to digest, very soluble for the human body. Protein yeah. from soybeans, protein from peanuts, not so much. So That's I could when say, the plants fight back. Yeah. So I could say, oh, well, I ate, I ate uh, you know, 30 grams of, of peanut butter today. So I got or 30 grams of peanut butter in, in terms of protein today, you know, that it's not, this, it's not going to be as bioavailable as if I ate 30 grams of eggs a day, um, right. you know, ribeye and, a day. And then there are those things in the plant that like uh, with soybeans, you've got the phytoestrogens, which are very harmful. You've got the phytic acid, which is very harmful to the gut and binds to minerals. So you lose some of your mineral absorption and the enzyme inhibitors and all of that. So yeah, I think you're onto something. Now, some of those things can be neutralized through fermentation and cooking, but like soybeans, so many people do soy for protein and they're taking in a lot of phytoestrogens. Mm -hmm. It's insane. And we shouldn't be eating that. It's, it's not really given to us as food anyway. But what an interesting concept. And then le le lectins. I always, my tongue yeah, wants to lecithins, but lectins. Yeah. And so you're avoiding the lectins that are in things like tomatoes, potatoes, eggplant, and night other shades. foods. Yep. All the nightshades, which are really harmful, especially when you have a gut issue. Yeah. So you're avoiding that with a carnivore diet, but you're getting... Um, you're getting lots of protein, you're getting fat and fat soluble activators, and you're getting minerals. Are there some nutrients that you feel like you're missing out on that maybe you need to, do you take a supplement? I, before I say what I was about to say, I'll let you answer. Yeah, so uh, some people, if they're on a like true lion's diet version of carnivore, where they're only yeah. eating steak or red meat, um, they might have an iodine deficiency. Mm -hmm. um, so I actually eat, uh, you know, I got seafood tilapia or um, sockeye salmon, really good wild caught salmon, uh, shrimp, you know, and so ocean foods are where people get natural sources of iodine. Uh, you don't need a whole lot. So if someone is doing carnivore and they're like strictly 100% beef or herbivore meat, uh, which would, you know, you can't eat pork and, you know, chicken, all the other stuff, then um, I would recommend adding some drops of iodine into your water, um, you know, or taking an iodine supplement. So that way uh, you're not in an iodine deficiency. Uh, but other than that, yeah. like I function normally, I function actually better than if I'm on, you know, regular food, especially yeah. on junk food, but even regular food, healthy food. Um, you know, so I'm not necessarily missing any vitamins and minerals. Um, where I might feel a little weird is if I'm not drinking enough water, if mm -hmm. I don't have enough salt in my diet, which yes. is a huge mental shift because I'm like, you know, the government's like, oh, don't eat too much salt. And in carnivore and keto, they're like, no, you need salt, but you need well, you do, quality source salt. Yeah, because in order to produce hydrochloric acid, to digest all of that protein, you need salt to produce hydrochloric acid, but every cell in our body needs it anyway. So that's like a given. I will say that on iodine, nearly everyone is iodine deficient in my opinion anyway, because our soils are, are now deficient in iodine. So it doesn't matter what food plan you're on, you might wanna look at iodine supplementation. And, and uh, I actually take nascent iodine every day, just a couple of drops. Lugol's iodine is another, but regardless of what you're eating, that's probably a wise thing to do. And you can get tested for it and you can take Lugol's iodine and paint it on the 
you know, on the inside of your arm and see how long it stays there. That's something a lot of people do. But I just assume that generally most people are going to be deficient in that anyway. Um, part of the reason why most people are deficient is because they don't live by an ocean or mm -hmm. they're not regularly eating seafare like, um, you know, people in Japan who are eating sushi regularly um, yeah. and things like that. So that's also really important in terms of context. Yeah. Well, you also mentioned the example of the lion. Um, and I want to bring up that uh, carnivores, carnivorous animals, they don't just eat the flesh. That's almost secondary. The first thing that a lion is going to eat, they're going to tear open the stomach cavity and they're going to eat the guts of the animal and they're eating mostly herbivores. So they're, so they're eating partially digested and partially fermented grasses, seeds, whatever, whatever, the, say if it's a rabbit and, and a coyote kills a rabbit, they're going to eat the stomach contents. I notice, oh, I notice more than I want to with one of our cats that's inside outside who loves leading, leaving little presents on our doorstep. That animal will eat the whole body, but I do notice that she eats the innards. And then she typically leaves the head which is gross. I almost stepped on one last night in my bare feet. Um, but that's an aspect of a carnivore diet that I never hear anybody talk about, that really a, a carnivorous animal, if we're modeling our diet after a carnivorous animal, they're actually eating some vegetation because they're eating the guts, but they're also eating the you know, the organs. They're eating the organs of the animal, including the stomach contents. So that's where, again, in my mind, I would think eating some sauerkraut or some kind of a fermented vegetable would be a good idea because you'd be getting some more nutrients. So my, my, the question that lingers in my head is this, and if we look at a magnificent lion or say a horse, let's look at a horse, a, a lion might eat a horse. A horse eats nothing but grasses and you know foliage. And from that, that horse builds a magnificent body, right? So if we eat the carnivore that eats the herbivore, are we able to incorporate all of the nutrients that are the nutrient are the nutrients there in other words because that animal has say if you're eating beef that animal has been raised on pasture because we're not talking about going to the grocery store and buying just conventional meat that's been fed things that we don't even want to think about so let's talk about just consuming meats and fats and organ meats from animals that have been raised properly, naturally, regeneratively. Can we assume that all of the nutrients from the vegetation that that animal ate are incorporated into the flesh and the fat and the cartilage and all of that, of that animal that we're then consuming? So will we get all of the nutrients that the human body needs because we're eating something that eats all of those other nutrients that we're not eating? Does right. that make so, any sense? Yeah, I think I can. I think I can answer that. So, um, you know, when we're eating herbivores, we are getting the nutrients that is already available in their system. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, you went, and one thing I think is important is like, Hey, I'm not a legalist. So if someone is starting keto and carnivore for the first time, and maybe they're not buying their, their produce from a farmer's market or, uh, whole foods, but they're going to Walmart or Kroger or food line. If you, if you live in North Carolina, um, <laughs> you know, there's no shame in that. I, I'm, you know, it's more of a, how purist do I want to be in, on this journey? Um, and it still is going to be better than Krispy Kreme donuts. Exactly. So going to be better than Oreos. So going to be better than Pop Tarts. Yeah. So going to be better than McDonald's. Um, you know, and that's the important thing. Uh, but in terms of like uh, language, 
carnivore is not necessarily meant to be taken literally. So I think just in terms of that, like I, I eat dairy, carnivores out in the wild are not eating dairy. If they are, I'd love to hear about it, but I, I don't think I've ever met a carnivore. Well, they will dairy. if they get the chance. <laughs> the kittens yeah, but, used to gather around my feet while I was milking the cow, but yeah, yeah, that's but a like different the, thing. Domestic animals and stuff, that's different. Yeah. Uh, they yeah. have a little bit wider palate and, and interests. Um, yeah. You know, so I think it's important to look at human history. Um, yes, meat is a more bioavailable protein and mm -hmm. um, food source. Well, why are, why are we eating plants then? Well, if you think about it, um, you know, for many cultures, even still today, uh, they were migratory based on, you know, the migration patterns of herbivores that were going in herds. Um, mm -hmm. You know, so in the by and by between each hunt, they need to eat something. Well, you know, yeah. am I getting, getting a lot of bioavailable proteins and nutrients from berries and other plants as much as I would from meat? No, but is it better than starving? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's another important context to understand. So when I do eat herbivore meats, um, you know, I am getting what I need in terms of my bodily functions. Uh, okay. Again, when I go into complications, it really is I'm not drinking enough water. I'm not drinking enough. Um, I'm not eating enough salt or I'm not getting enough um, fat in my diet. Uh, because again, I'm in ketosis, so my energy level is dependent on the amount of fat I either have stored in my body or what fat yeah. I am consuming, whether it be uh, animal fat or dairy. Yeah, okay, that makes sense. And of course, many of the nutrients that our body needs are stored in the fat. So when we eat the protein and not eliminate the fatty part of the animal, we're going to get nutrients from the fat as well. So this is just where my mind has gone for years. Okay, so how does the carnivore diet really work? Are you going to get all of these things? And I'm thinking that yes, <laughs> you can. And I was just looking up um, about what Abram and Sarah fed the heavenly angels. And of course, they, they prepared the fatted calf and she also served curds and whey. So there was the dairy. Now she also prepared bread. And bread is not going to be on the carnivore diet. Yeah, I don't think God is uh, gluten intolerant. No, I don't, I don't think, and I don't think we're supposed to be either. I don't believe that celiac is something that uh, God built into human beings. I think it's a result of all that we've done to ourselves with a very poor diet and probably stress and toxins in the atmosphere. But one of those questions that I had in my mind also was, was how does the carnivore diet jive with the biblical diet? And we don't see one prescribed diet other than in the book of Genesis in the very beginning before the fall, when Adam and Eve and their, their children were consuming all of their food from plants, presumably. But once Noah and his family left the ark, they're eating, okay, they're eating clean meat. So we'll hit that very sensitive topic briefly because we do get asked, and you probably get asked the same question. So if you're eating all meat or almost entirely meat, then where does the clean and the unclean come in? And does it matter? Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on that? You have to be asked that a lot. Yeah, so to go back to some of your, your uh, examples, um, even in Genesis, you know, the sacrifice of an animal was as early as uh, when uh, Adam and Eve had sinned by eating uh, the fruit of good and evil. And, oh, guess what? They needed clothes and figs were just not going to do it. So uh, yeah. God used an animal hide. I'm pretty sure he didn't just have some spare. It, it came from some type of animal. Yeah. Uh, and then you look at um, uh, Cain and Abel. Cain was a mm -hmm. produce farmer or grow produce, and Abel had a flock. Uh, right. And so, you know, there's also another indication that 
there probably was meat consumption because Abel was li literally, you wouldn't need a flock unless you were going to manage and eat um, yeah. your, you know, your animals usually. Uh, so, you know, animal sacrifice, you mentioned, uh, you know, how uh, the Israelites would, you know, burn the fatted calf, burn the fat, just the fat at times. Uh, so God definitely likes meat, I think. And <laughs> um, fat. And fat. Meat so, and fat. Uh, so I think what's interesting is, um, you know, in terms of clean and unclean, uh, people tend to go to Levitical law and they will say, well, you know, here's a list of all the things that you can't eat. Uh, and here's the things, the things that you are allowed to eat. And even with the things that you are allowed to eat, you're only allowed to eat certain parts or some parts that you're not allowed to eat. Um, you know, and so and here's have how you have to do it. prepared a certain way, slaughtered yep. a certain way, raised yep. a certain way. Yeah. Yeah. And what a lot of people don't understand is God gave them those um, those commands for a specific reason. Uh, and part of the reason why is because a lot of the cleaning lists, uh, you know, clean animals versus unclean. Why, why can't I eat a pig? Well, a pig is in, in that culture, bottom mm -hmm. feeder. Uh, you can go back to China and there were actual documentation where uh, Chinese, and this is ancient China, where Chinese would have a bathroom and then below would be a pit where the pigs would be. So the pigs were yeah. eating human feces and growing off of that. You talk to some farmers yeah. today, I talked to a dairy farmer and uh, he was like, you know what, I, best pork I ever ate was pork from a pig who ate the feces of my cows. And, you know, oh. I think they had like different types of grains and stuff like that. You know, it yeah. was weird, but it was the best taste of pork I've ever had. You know, so the, the cleanliness aspect really in a lot of cases came from hygiene. Yeah. Uh, and so we have to understand the context behind a lot of those laws. Uh, yeah. There are certain diseases that some of these animals had, or they're just simply bottom dwellers. So they're never really going to get the, the creme de la creme in terms of clean eating. Um, I'm pretty sure catfish would have been added into that list if catfish yeah. was there. Um, yeah. So I think that's important for, for history is understanding the context of the law rather than just blindly following it. Um, and then another thing I, I'd say about clean and unclean is that, you know, if you identify as a Christian and you have a personal conviction to follow certain Levitical laws, uh, Levitical laws in terms of food, it puts you in kind of a sticky bind because if you're going to follow some food dietary laws, then you kind of have to follow all the other laws when it comes exactly. to Levitical laws. Do, yeah. do you want to be enslaved to that? Because trust me, it will come to that. Paul talks about in Romans that uh, the law was not given to save. It was given to increase the trespass. It was given to show, hey, the law. When you fall short, this is how this is how fall how short you're falling. You know, mm -hmm. this is why we need God's presence. Why we need God's mercy and grace. Uh, we can't earn our salvation. We can't earn righteousness as a Christian. My righteousness is is from God. I can't earn it. I wasn't born into it. There's nothing I could do to earn God's love or respect or approval. He already loves me before I was even born. Um, yeah. So if someone's having problems like, do I live in Levitical food laws or not? Um, I'd say if God's giving you a personal conviction, cool, great. But if you're just being a legalist, it's a little different. And yeah. some the, some verses I'd like to look at would be, you know, you can look at uh, Peter's sign in Acts where yeah, uh, Acts chapter God, ten. Yep, where God's uh, calling Peter to meet a group of essentially Gentiles, people mm -hmm. who are not Jewish. And, um, you know, he gives them a vision twice about uh, this tapestry of all the animals. And God says, Peter, go kill and eat. And yep. Peter's like, wait, but there are animals on there that are unclean. And God literally says, what do you call unclean that I have called clean? Yeah. Right. And so you also go into Acts where um, uh, the uh, Jewish people who were recent converts to Christianity, but were Jewish originally, how they were telling all the people in their church congregation, hey, Gentiles, if you want to be a Christian, if you want to be saved, you need to follow Levitical law. 
And so the early, early church with the 12 disciples and, and so on, you know, came up with, after prayer and consideration, how they handled those types of situations. And they gave leniency for Gentiles when it came to food laws and regulations because they didn't want the food to be a stumbling block. Um, so I look at it this way because sometimes old ancient context is hard to navigate because we yeah. don't live in that context. So I'll update it to 2024. Unclean food, Krispy Kreme donuts, Oreos, Skittles, Starburst, Pop-Tarts, Kentucky Fried Chicken. Um, Mountain Dew, Dr. Pepper, Mountain Dew, Coca-Cola. You know, even Gatorade, just nothing but sugar, by the way. But anyways, yeah. so like those things would be deemed unclean. And by the general public, most people would consider a lot of those junk foods to be unclean. If I said to someone who wanted, a, wanted to have a relationship with Jesus, oh, cool, great. Well, in order to, to have a relationship with Jesus Christ, you need to give up your junk food. You can't receive the Holy Spirit unless you give up your junk food. Yeah. Well, a it's lot of Christians thing. would be going to hell yep. if that's the case. You know, so it, God's not as interested in legalism as he is interested in relationship. And so if uh, for my own journey, I had to cut out all that junk food because it was killing me emotionally, mentally, physically and spiritually. Um, yeah. That was my personal conviction. There are people who are obese that will make it to heaven, just as there are people who are skinny and have been doing a keto, carnivore, Atkins, vegan, and will burn an attorney in hell. Yeah. You know, so it, it's, yeah. it's beyond just the food laws and regulations. Go ahead. Yeah. And, and I agree. Um, I do think that the whole idea of Peter and the sheet is twofold. And here I'm quoting from Acts chapter 10, verses 34 and 35. God, God shows no partiality. But in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. And so he, uh, Christ, in his uh, fulfilling of the law, fulfilling of prophecy by dying on that cross and being resurrected, he brings salvation to all. We're no longer under the law. But if you're going to say that, well, you have to stick to the Levitical law when it comes to eating clean or unclean, then you need to also be keeping the full law. You cannot, it, it's hypocritical to say that you have to keep this part of the law, but not the whole law. So are we going to sacrifice? We don't need to sacrifice anymore because mm -hmm. Jesus is our perfect sacrifice. But there are a whole lot of other laws in the Levitical law that the Jews had to keep. And in fact, um, just as Paul says, the, the old law is his teacher. The old law is our teacher to show us that we can't earn salvation. You mentioned that. And so I set aside that part of the Levitical law because I set aside the political, uh, the Levitical law, because it's no longer, it's no longer relevant to today. So I just wanted to touch on that because some people will, well, they'll tune you and I out totally just with a name like pork crying or saying that, you know, my saying that I eat shrimp, I love shrimp, and I like catfish, and um, and I really love bacon. So was, Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. <laughs> praise the Lord. That's right. Weston A. Price Foundation used to have a, a cute sticker that they sold that um, it was mimicking the sal Salvation Army, but it was the salivation army and it said praise the lord <laughs> i still have one somewhere um so on a carnivore diet and the the way that you're eating you're eating a wide variety of animal-based foods including dairy i would hope you're eating yogurt my favorite is trimona i think you can get it in in north carolina you're drinking some raw milk if you're wanting to stay in ketosis, you're probably going to not drink very much fresh raw milk, but cultured raw milk would be preferable. But that would be acceptable on a, on a carnivore diet, even if some people might take it further and say no to the dairy. I think dairy is wonderful. Bacon and butter are the two best foods that God gave us on the In all of creation, butter and bacon. 
and sometimes they really go well together. I think I yeah. can get behind that. <laughs> yeah, butter, just, you know, get cut some slices of butter, sprinkle mm -hmm. a little bit of salt on it. Oh, oh so good. Yes. So good. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, they don't in, they don't encourage milk drinking a lot in carnivore um, just because uh, they would prefer heavy cream because it's just mm -hmm. pure cream. Um, yeah. There's not a whole lot of, you know, sugar in that. And especially right. if you're going to go to raw milk, a lot of these folks are also doing uh, grass fed, um, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. uh, cattle with raw milk. Some of, some of the sweetest milk you'll ever have. So be careful if you're doing, trying to do carnivore. Yeah, I know. I used to joke about being the healthiest fat person back when I lived on the farm, believe it or not. And I was working so hard physically and raising kids and mucking stalls and all of that. But I was drinking a lot of wonderful, rich Jersey milk and eating a lot of my sourdough bread with mm -hmm. lots of butter. But I was eating a lot of that in addition to everything else. And I, like you, was more than 50 pounds overweight. I was closer to 60 pounds overweight. Um, so those good things, too much of a good thing is not a good thing. Um, so on a carnivore diet, what, what are you eating? What does a typical day look like for you in terms of your plate? So it changes. Um, again, I, I eat seafood, poultry, mm -hmm. uh, eggs, um, and red meat. And seafood also includes shrimp. So I try to switch it up. Um, you know, it might be sam seafood, salmon, tuna, tilapia. Tilapia is not, you know, that's probably a little bit of the lesser, not as desirable for carnivore. Um, tends okay. not to be as nutritionally dense compared mm -hmm. to tuna and salmon. Um, for red meat, it's gonna be beef and pork. Uh, haven't got a hold of any venison or wild game meat, but I'll probably go hunting um, again in October. So that's usually okay. around our hunting season in North Carolina. Uh, poultry, chicken, eggs, pasture raised eggs. Um, then for dairy, it's whole milk, whole fat, Greek yogurt, um and butter and heavy cream and yeah. uh, cream cheese so these are all things that again we ain't gotta be legalists you know you can find mm -hmm. it all at at wally world Do i agree with wally world no you can find it at whole foods you can find it at wherever your local grocery store is you can find it at costco i mean yeah, there's costco. a lot that i buy at costco i couldn't feed the armies that i feed every week if i didn't go to costco and she got a big army though. big but army <laughs> yeah, we have an army to feed coming up in a couple of weeks and you're going to be part of that. But uh, um, yeah, <laughs> and we're going to have organ meatloaf. And oh, uh, yep, so you'll get some of that. Um, and it will have pork rinds in it, by the way. Oh, praise Instead God. Instead <laughs> of bread, it will have pork rinds. So yeah. Um, you're you're inspiring me to to give it a go. Actually, I may just make the month of April. It's only April. What is it? Today's the third. So we have 27 days of April. I think. What do you think? Is it a good idea? Should I give it a try and let people see what happens with me? Now That's I will do the yogurt. Mm -hmm. I'll do the heavy cream because I drink tea every morning and sometimes in the afternoon because I just enjoy it so much or a coffee. Oh, is that acceptable? Oh, you, 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 can get, a, do tea? you get a landmine there. So the purists would say no tea. Well, no coffee, especially coffee. Um, the liberal uh, carnivores would probably be Less like, yeah, I, I drink coffee. You know, yeah. um, I like tea because and I'll, I'll drink black tea because yeah. I don't get jitters. When I drink coffee, I get jitters. So if I you're getting too. jitters, just probably don't want to drink coffee. Just like I triple steep my tea. Um, so it's just like real nice, dark, thick, mm -hmm. dark tea. Uh, and yeah. then I add some heavy cream and uh, yeah. some monk fruit sweet extract uh, to sweeten up a little too. bit. Yeah. And I put butter in mine also. And actually with the coffee, if I drink a cup, 
if I drink a cup of coffee, which is almost every day, but not every day anymore, I put butter and heavy cream in it. And then I don't get jittery. And if I'm traveling long distances, so I'm getting tired, I'll drink maybe two cups of coffee in a day. But the heavy cream and the butter tempers the jitters. So that is helpful. But um, okay, so the other thing that I will do less legalistically is I will definitely consume my yogurt. And as I said, the cream, the heavy cream in my coffee, one of the reasons actually why I come to this particular store to do my shopping once a month is I can buy half gallons of cream, of grass fed cream. So I will do that today. But as of this moment today, I'm making the commitment to all of you to do carnivore for for the rest of a month so basically for an entire month i will do carnivore and i will include my trimona yogurt which is another reason why i come to wegmans and my heavy cream in my tea but uh, and and the other thing though that i will do is my ferments because i believe very strongly in ferments for gut health for protein and fat digestion and absorption and for cleansing because it helps you to cleanse. It helps your gut to cleanse, it helps your liver to cleanse. So I'm going to do that. So that's where my on the fence part goes. But I will commit to the rest of this month just doing carnivore and I'll report, actually we'll probably wanna jump on with you, Ryan, and, and talk about that and see what I did. I'm currently working on a program where I'm getting exercise for 30 minutes a day, usually five days a week, sometimes six. I'm doing a sauna blanket three or four days a week for 45 minutes. And then I'll incorporate this and we're gonna see where it goes because I have about 25 pounds that I really want to drop and I want to see how it will affect my health. So I say that, I want you to tell me what you have noticed, how physically and mentally doing carnivore has affected your body and your mind. Yeah, so I, I'd even add keto to that as well. Um, mm -hmm. The biggest thing is I, I got a lot of mental clarity because I wasn't numbing myself or hypering up myself with artificial sweeteners and or not artificial sweeteners, but with a lot of sugar right. and carbs. Um, so that was one thing. And uh, another thing was I wasn't, uh, I'm, I'm able to sleep better okay. before I'd get like five hours, six would be really rare for me, six hours of sleep. Now my body can go six to seven hours of sleep that Good. might not be a huge leap to like eight or nine hours but like an extra two hours of sleep is beautiful i would um, like that too yeah you know and, and so i have to go to bed even earlier than i normally or used to because i want to maximize more on the amount of sleep that i can get um you know also i've noticed like inflammation that i had in my knee and in my hip uh I think part of it was because I got in a car accident several years ago, like over a decade ago. And then um, there was a misalignment in my spine that I just kept overcompensating with for years to the point where my knee was starting to actually get in pain. And my, on the other side, my hip was getting in a lot of pain. Um, and so being on keto, being on carnivore allowed for that inflammation to essentially almost become virtually non-existent. Um, Wonderful. So that's another thing. And also, I just think just a personal, a, a better relationship with God through that, because it was a problem. Like, it was really an addiction, a food addiction to let go of all the sweet foods, all the fast foods, the candies, uh, binge eating. Um, and I really had to trust God in that process. Um, so I feel like my relationship with God also got a lot better because Good. I said, I don't have control. I don't have the willpower. I don't have the self-discipline. I don't believe in that, but I'm self-discipline. Um, I need your help, God, to get through this. And, you know, God has met me in my surrender and has given me a pathway towards peace, a pathway towards better health, a pathway where I actually like how I look 
rather than looking in the mirror with a lot of shame and insecurity, not going out to events because I'm 50 pounds overweight and I can't fit in the clothes yeah. I used to be able to fit into, yet still in denial. So I'm not buying bigger clothes. I'm trying to still fit in my small clothes. So yeah, I don't got to go through that anymore. I get to be my genuine, authentic self. With the diet. That's wonderful. And the genuine, authentic self is who we love. But I completely get it. I understand. I've lived in shame. I lived in shame for years. Yep, not feeling good about myself for a lot of reasons, and being overweight was one of them. So, poor crying. This has been a really informative and enlightening and encouraging conversation. I'm really grateful. And uh, hey, everybody, if you want to hear more from poor crying, he has spoken for us in the past, but he's going to be delivering our Sunday morning lesson when we are at Melvin's Farm to Fork, April 19th, 20th, and 21st in Little Wurtz, Virginia, near Roanoke or Rocky Mount, Virginia. So that is our God-given food conference, uh, excuse me, God-given food as medicine conference, and it is just packed with fantastic topics focused first on prevention and then on healing. And all of this is so very important to all of us. We, we want you to come. We want you to hear all of our guests and all of the wonderful topics that we have. And then come and, and hear Pork Crying on Sunday morning. Deliver a really good lesson. Worship with us. Our friend Ken will be leading our worship service again. It's going to be a fantastic event and we'd love to see you there. So we have details about that in the links beneath the, uh, I guess in the comments or wherever you put those. I don't know, Aaron does that stuff. I just trust that they're there. So hopefully we'll see you there. And uh, Ryan, we're really looking forward to seeing you and Mackenzie too, so. She's excited, <laughs> she'll be there. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad, we're really glad. So um, we're going to end on that note, but it's been a great conversation, and I'm so very thankful for this. Um, uh, I just really appreciate and love you, Ryan. You know that. Yep. <laughs> yep. So um, we'll see you soon, and hopefully we'll see lots of our listeners there as well. Have a great week. And come back next week at 3 o'clock, and I should be able to tell you who we have on. But I, as usual, don't remember. But we'll let you know ahead of time. <laughs> It'll be another great interview and, a, and another good session. So until next week, we'll see everyone. And Ryan, thanks again. Thanks, Maureen. You're welcome.